All right, guys, so in this video, we're going to be going through everything that an electrical engineer needs to know about semiconductors. It's just going to be a very quick, basically, revision. Watch this video and you'll know everything that you need to know as an electrical engineering student when it comes to semiconductors. And in the next video, we're going to touch on diodes. So, yeah, we'll touch on things like the different materials that we use for semiconductors. We'll go into covalent bonding when it comes to atoms, how you construct P type and N type materials, the response times of the different materials, how temperature affects things and something called the energy levels and energy bands, and then how we go about constructing a diode. Yeah, so let's get into it. So don't worry too much about semiconductors. You just need to know that there are special elements that have a conductivity somewhere in the region of between an insulator and a conductor. So the three main semiconductors that you, we care about are GE, SI, and GAAS. So GE standing for germanium, SI standing for silicon, and GAAS standing for gallium arsenide. Germanium is fairly old school and is only used really in some unique circumstances nowadays. Silicon is what's inside all of our, all of our computers, so all of our CPUs, are they use silicon. And then gallium arsenide is, I suppose, more of the newer semiconductor, which is better, but not quite fully in use yet. But it is used in things like LEDs and stuff. So here's my little drawing of an atom. Now, the important point to know about atoms, if we're going to discuss semiconductors, is you need to know about the valence electrons which are basically the outer shell electrons so for materials that where the outer shell is not closed then the valence electrons can actually form bonds these bonds are called covalent bonds so covalent bonding is an important part of electronics especially when it comes to understanding how a diode works so very important to understand that atoms bonding together they become stronger by sharing valence electrons so the way to look at that is imagine you've got two atoms here each one has a spare valent electron. What these two atoms can do is they can actually join together and then share their valence electrons to create a stronger bond, which would look like this. So if you had atom A and atom B, they join together to make AB. Now you need to know when we're talking about semiconductors, if we say that they're intrinsic, that means that they're pure. That'll be something that when you read your textbooks, you'll see the word intrinsic a lot. It basically means pure. Another term that you'll see is relative mobility. The so relative mobility is the ability for free electrons or free carriers to move around the material. So using our example before about covalent bonding with atom A and atom B, let's look at silicon atoms. So a silicon atom has four valence electrons in its outer shell. So let's call this a silicon atom. Here it has its four valence electrons. Now we've got two of these atoms. If we wanted to join them, we would join them the same way that we did it up here. They would share and create a covalent bond with these two atoms here. That would look like this. So if you just kept on combining these atoms like this, then you'd form a silicon crystal. So our silicon crystal would look like that. You can see here all of the covalent bonding. All here. Again, I don't want this to be a physics lesson, so I'm not going to go any deeper than that. But let's just quickly touch on what are the relative mobilities of each of the various different materials that we use. So silicon, which is the most popular, has a relative mobility factor of 1,500. Germanium has a relative mobility factor of 3,900. And gallium arsenide has a relative mobility factor of 8,500. So don't worry too much about the units, but the key thing to know is that 1,500 is slower and 8,500 is faster. What this then relates to is the response time of devices that are made using those materials. So just keep in mind really here, a gallium arsenide is the fastest. So let's briefly just touch on doping quickly. So if we take our silicon crystal that we we had there earlier then if we replace for example one of these silicon atoms here and we dope it with something like boron well boron only has three outer valence electrons so because boron only has three outer valence electrons we then replace one of the electron covalent bonds here with a plus sign which indicates that we've, we've been left with a hole so now this vacancy in this silicon crystal structure now is ready to accept a free electron. This is actually how a p-type material is formed. So if we take that same silicon structure, but in this time, instead of using boron, if we use something like phosphorus, so phosphorus actually has five valence electrons. So what that means is you actually end up with a spare electron, which we see in here, which isn't bonded to anything. This is called a free electron. So you do this to the crystal and you end up with an n-type. So any semiconductor that's actually been doped, we call it an extrinsic material. And so as we mentioned up here, intrinsic is pure, extrinsic is a doped material, i.e. impure, meaning because we've put either 
this atom or this atom here. And it doesn't have to just be boron or phosphorus. As long as when you're creating p-type materials, you're using uh, atom that has only three valence electrons, then you're gonna be, you're always gonna be creating holes. And if you're using an atom that has five electrons, then you're gonna valence electrons that is, and you're gonna be creating three electrons. Let's talk a little bit about temperature when it comes to semiconductors. So you should know that when it comes to conductors, when you heat up a conductor, the resistance increases. So conductors have a positive temperature coefficient. So when heat increases, so does resistance. So semiconductors are actually different. They're the opposite. So when they increase in heat, then the resistance falls. You don't really need to worry about the explanation for this as long as you keep that in mind. But the actual explanation is that when the temperature increases more and more, more and more valence electrons absorb the thermal energy which break the covalent bonds and then increase the amount of free carriers in that material. More free carriers equals less resistance. So when it comes to semiconductors, we're mostly focusing on silicon, germanium, and gallium arsenide. So there's a concept called energy levels and energy bands, which again, I'm not gonna go too much into. So the valence electrons in an atom, they have the most amount of energy. The reason being is the further that an electron is away from the nucleus, the higher the energy state that it's in. Well, valence electrons exist within what is called the valence band. So if you imagine that you have a valence band here, so if this is the nucleus and then you've got the valence electrons, they're going around this band, right? Now, in order for them to conduct, they actually have to leave this valence band and enter what is called the conduction band. Now, normally, if you just leave the electrons alone, they're going to just stay in their valence band and continually circling around the nucleus. However, if you apply energy to those electrons, you can actually get them to leave the valence band and make this cross over into the conduction band. So this gap here between the valence band and the conduction band is called the energy gap. So the amount of voltage that needs to be applied in order to get the electrons to jump from the valence band to the conduction band across the energy gap is different depending upon the material. So you've got germanium, you've got silicon, and you've got gallium arsenide, right? Germanium actually requires the least 0.67 electron volts. Silicon actually requires 1.1 electron volts. And gallium arsenide requires 1.43 electron volts. The reason why germanium requires the least is because this gap, this energy gap is smallest in germanium. And gallium arsenide has the largest gap. Having a smaller or larger gap is not necessarily a positive or a negative thing. It actually just means that they can be used for different uses. And all it really means in practice is that the larger the gap, the less sensitive it is to temperature. The smaller the gap, the more sensitive it is to temperature. So if a device is sensitive to temperature, then that's perfect for things like photo detectors. And if it's not really that sensitive towards temperature, then it's perfect for things like transistors. So valence electrons inside gallium arsenide, they must actually absorb more energy in order for them to leave the valence band and enter the conduction band. And so when, the ent when electrons enter this conduction band here, this is when they become free carriers. This is actually a very important point when it comes to LEDs as well, which I'll touch on in later on in the video, but I'll just briefly mention it here, which is that if this energy gap here is small, then when electrons cross over it, they usually dissipate some heat. Well, they're actually dissipating thermal energy and they dissipate that thermal energy as heat. In, if the gap is large, as is the case with gallium arsenide, then they dissipate that thermal energy as light radiation, which is why we actually use gallium arsenide for LEDs. Okay, so let, let's swing over to our N-type and P-type again. So these are our two types of semiconductors that have been doped, right? So here you can see in an N-type semiconductor, we have more free electrons than we do holes. And in the P-type semiconductor, we have more holes than we do electrons. So N-type electrons more than holes. P type holds on more than electrons. So in the N type material, the electrons, and it says more of them, they are actually called the majority carrier. And the holes in the N type, since there's less of them, they're called the minority carrier, which is obvious, right? In the P type, it's the opposite. So the holes in the P type are the majority carriers, and the electrons are the minority carriers. What do we mean by majority and minority carriers? Well, we're just talking about current. That's it which I know a lot of students get confused over. And all it means is that in an N-type, the electrons, they carry the majority of the current. In P-type, the electrons carry the minority, the smaller amount of the current. And in the N-type, the holes carry the lesser amount of current. That's it.
you do need to know this but you don't need to know it beyond that and so that's it Let, literally that that is everything you need to know about semiconductors as an electrical engineering student when you have this n-type material and this p-type material those are the basic building blocks of semiconductor devices so we use this for diodes we use it for transistors so for a diode you take the p-type and the n-type you join them together like that and then now you've got a diode if you then take this take it take another n-type material let's call it here and then we stick this n-type material onto the end of this like this now you've got a transistor so you know i get, I get for most electrical engineering students especially if you're into electronics and stuff this stuff might be boring but honestly it's worth it just looking at it like this it's not too difficult yes if you go deep into textbooks it does get a bit sticky but keep it simple like this all you really need to know is germanium silicon gallium arsenide what covalent bonding is what in terms of relative mobility how you construct p types and n types by doping them how they're better than conductors in terms of when they're heated up the resistance goes down they conduct better and then you obviously just need to know a bit about energy levels and bands and why certain materials are better for certain things like gallium arsenide is better for leds that kind of stuff but yeah so super simple so in the next video we will go much deeper and take a much deeper look into diodes thanks for watching